Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the second in our webinar series on concrete bridge durability. Uh, today's webinar is Don't Patch It, Repair It, led by Chris Ball, whom I'll introduce here in just a minute. This series is being brought to you by uh, Vector Corrosion and the National Concrete Bridge Council. We teamed up together uh, when Vector came to us and said, hey, we think there's a lot more information we could help you all provide. Uh, the National Concrete Bridge Council is a consortium of 10 industry groups, uh, all aimed at promoting concrete bridge quality, uh, both construction and design. And one of the things we put into our strategic plan uh, a couple years ago was about trying to disseminate more information uh, on concrete bridge stewardship, as we call, like to call it, just the overarching, how do we take care of our concrete bridges? And that was sort of the genesis then for this webinar series. And you can see there on screen, uh, the logos of all the industry uh, institutes that are part of the National Concrete Bridge Council. And you can always go to our website, which is national, nationalconcretebridge.org, or you can always just Google search National Concrete Bridge Council. Again, this is the second in our webinar series, and I'd encourage you to sign up if you haven't already for the remaining four sessions. And you see here on screen, the titles of the topics we're going to cover. We're going to be getting into a lot more in-depth detail uh, on some of the treatments from electrochemical to encasements to cathodic protection. Um, so that's, uh, there's a good series of uh, educational opportunities coming uh, throughout the next six sessions into March of next year. So when we get to the end, we'll do a moderated Q&A. Uh, and we, this is also a competition. And what I mean by that is the person who uh, asks the most or best questions, not necessarily the most, but the best questions as picked by the, our, our presenter uh, will receive a $100 Amazon gift card. So again, encourage you to stay with us to the end and ask questions. And again, we're looking for those good questions in the eyes of the presenter. So our presenter today is Mr. Chris Ball, who's the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Vector Corrosion Technologies. He has over 25 years of construction experience in the industry, is a member of a number of uh, industry uh, professional groups. You'll see on screen, I'm not going to read them all. Uh, all of these are really focusing on concrete repair and Chris's Therefore, um, through his involvement in this and his experience in the industry is, is one of the foremost in the country uh, on concrete uh, repair. And so we're really pleased to have him joining us today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Chris, okay. and probably shut off my camera and my, as well and, <laughs> uh, and listen in. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate the kind words there, Greg. Um, some of that probably just comes with uh, with time in the in the industry, but, before we get started, I just really wanted to say, you know, thank you to yourself, Greg, and to the NCBC organization and your uh, industry members for their interest in, in promoting, you know, rehabilitation of structures and extension of service life. It's a very important, uh, important topic, and uh, it's not only good, you know, financially, uh, but also from a sustainability standpoint. So there's a lot of good, a lot of good messages there. So um, as we get into the, the presentation, um, really the fundamental, um, I, I would say, point um, of, of this of this presentation is really just durable concrete repairs. And you know, I've kind of I gotten a little bit on my soapbox periodically with, at times about the term patching. And to me, con concrete patching is is a, is a common term. But um, to me, it just it seems very, uh, very temporary. It's like a, it's like a, a patch or, or a band aid, and we know, you know, from the experience that we have with the various industry organizations, including some of them that are members of NCBC, there's a lot of techniques and technologies that are available to make durable uh, and effective, long-lasting repairs, and so that's really what the top, the primary topic is, um, is today. So, um, you know, just the, the current state of the, the, re, the repair industry, um, you know, corrosion is a big, uh, a big issue, obviously, on, on structures. And um, a few years ago, uh, NACE or, or AMP today had, had a, um, directed a, a, a study to, to try to determine what the cost of corrosion is to the economy. And they came up at 
um, somewhere around 3% of direct co cost of GDP was uh, basically dealing with, uh, with, with corrosion and that there were indirect costs just equal to that, so approximately 6%. But whether it's three or five or seven, you know, those numbers are significant. I think that's the point that it's a significant cost. So anything that we can do to keep structures in place is really a, a good investment of, of time and, and time and money. And you see some other estimates that were available on, on the, the cost of repair and strengthen customers. We're talking about billions of dollars. And unfortunately, this is a study that was from about 20 years ago. Um, there was a report that uh, about 50% of the repairs are only were not performing satisfactorily. I would venture to guess that that number is probably higher today than than then. But the say this, the point is that we can always do a better job on 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 just being knowledgeable and uh, about techniques and, and technologies to make durable repairs. So um, concrete repair, as I mentioned, really heavily influenced by uh, by corrosion and um, and in, in the U.S., it's significantly driven by by uh, the use of de-icing chemicals, which are necessary for you know keep the the roadways uh, safe during the winter time. But you know it has a residual effect on on the concrete. Obviously, you can have corrosion due to marine structures as well, and you can have corrosion that's related to even structures that have no chloride exposure just due to age and exposure to carbon dioxide conditions. But a big driver of what we're talking about is is uh, de-icing salt or chloride contaminated structures. So just a few pictures that we've taken through through the years of, of different structures, you know, and some of these like this, these two here, this one on the, on the bottom left is actually a, um, a shot creep repair that um, was uh, it was, was not durable. And I don't think it was necessarily due to the shot creep itself. But just to look at some of the practices about chipping behind the bars and other things that, you know, the, at the end of the day, was the actual corrosion um, issue addressed by the repair? And the same thing here in the top middle, and you have to give the owner credit here for, you know, applying a protective coating to a structure, and I'm sure it probably helped, but you see the concrete spalling that occurred underneath of the, of the coating. So that treatment in and of itself did not really um, address the underlying corrosion issue. And then you just other examples of cor corrosion, you know, top left is a lot. We, the decks are the visible issues, but in reality, you know, the substructures are the real challenge in a lot of ways because of the, the whole bridge is obviously supported by the substructure and joint maintenance and leaking joints and chloride contamination of, of piers. And um, you see on the top left and, and the bottom right. Um, so, you know, basically what's happening is that your 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 corrosion is is, is causing the, the reinforcing steel to uh, the corrosion products are expanding and, and cracking the concrete and, uh, you know, it allows more chlorides and it's just a continual process. And there's a lot of information out there to, already today that, uh, that's available. And I was mentioned a few um, resources that are available to deal with corrosion related uh, repairs. They're available from many industry organizations. Like I said, some that are members of, of the NCBC. The International Concrete Repair Institute is very heavily focused on obviously concrete repair um, and uh, does a really good job. American Concrete Institute, which I'm, I'm fairly involved in, uh, has a whole section uh, that's just focused on, on repair and re rehabilitation. AMP, obviously, National Association of Crows Engineers, um, uh, merged with the Society of Special Coatings uh, to create uh, AMP, uh, Federal Highway Administration, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and there are many of them out, others out there. But one just uh, just kind of point out the the FHWA does have a bridge preservation guide and it's uh, free to download. Uh, it was updated in 2018. And I thought it was just uh, an interesting as pulled a, um, a quote out of, out of there basically in the introduction that, you know, due to limited funds and uh, competition for funds that, you know, bridge owner, owners are challenged to cost effectively preserve and maintain their bridges. And but that bridge owners are striving to be more strategic by adopting and implementing systematic processes for bridge preservation as an integral component of asset management. So 
I think the point we're making, if we're going to, if we're going to, we're going to need to do concrete repairs. Let's do them the best we can and make use of the information that's available today. From ICRI, I'll just kind of show some of the documents I think are really useful, and maybe you just want to jot these down. Or ICRI is icri.org. Um, you have um, one of the original documents that ICRI created back in the day was uh, the guides for surface preparation for repair of, of corroding structures. And actually, I'm going to use that as a guide for, my, for a lot of my presentation on on, on different types of, of, of the process of, of, of fundamentally doing good quality repairs. But um, they also have a nice guide for electrochemical treatments. So these are um, basically other techniques to help deal with corrosion issues uh, beyond beyond the repair itself and there's a nice guide from icri um, I, I think one of the most popular things you'll see from icri are their uh, surface profile chips and i encourage you to, to look look at those they're a very a very good reference and uh, my understanding they're also working on some um, representative um, coupons for surface preparation and cleaning of reinforcing steel in the repairs as well but these chips are um, basically a good a good reference to give you a, a guide for the surface profile or surface roughness for anything from sealers and coatings to you know even concrete overlays and uh, and some manufacturers will actually use um, the concrete surface profile or CSP number to to give it the contractors and the owners a guide a guideline for the amount of surface preparation that they're looking for for their materials. Um, ICRI also has a concrete surface repair technician certification program. It's a fairly fairly uh, comprehensive. And there's two parts. You know, the first part is online um, kind of learning, and then there's actually a practical like hands-on exam where you do th things, you know, it starts off by learning what is concrete, what is concrete repair, and then you end up doing things such as, you know, making sure, you know, they understand slump testing and and direct bond testing through the, uh, the service repair technician certification program. Once again, other industry um, resources that are available. On the ACI side, um, I think there's some really nice documents out there through um, the repair application procedures. This is the um, ACI committee E706 that puts these together. And there's a series of these. They're available for online learning. They're free. They're free, free available to um, non-ACI members. You do have to register to, to download them, but um, uh, there's like ranges from epoxy injection to, you know, uh, sh there's a shot create repair, there are uh, form and pour, form and pump techniques, and it's uh, really a practical guide for for contractors. And um, and I think what's more more education. And also from I mentioned the Bureau of Reclamation, the you know, practices for um, uh, some of the research. Uh, these are a little bit more technical guides uh, that's available uh, to you know things that they're using for on the rec reclamation side. Um, have some really good uses, obviously, on the on the bridge market as well. So those are I just wanted to point out from, like I said, from all of our education and resource standpoint, things are available to help all of us improve the re repair and re rehabilitation of bridges. Um, I mean, Greg did the introduction. Uh, he said this is the second in the six part series. The first uh, part was uh, focused more on the evaluation side. I just kind of pulled this up. You know, when, this is a, a, a nice, I think, a, a flow chart that we've put together. Um, it's it's free. Also, you, know, you can contact us for a copy, or it's available on an educational website called WeSaveStructures.info. Um, so, you know, basically, the the point here is to, you know, rather than just jumping in and doing the repair or or, or a patch, as as you may may say. If we're really going to look at the durability of structures, we need to kind of look at it more holistically and really fundamentally have an understanding is, is this crack, you know, that you see visually, is it caused by corrosion? Is it caused by structural issues? Is it caused by ASR? You know, all those types of things will may lead you down to a different path on how you might want to fix a structure. So having an understanding of the cause of the damage through an evaluation and determining the, the not only the cause, but the magnitude and then you jump. Then you develop your repair strategy based on the the um, 
the owner's needs and budgets and all the way through quality control uh, in the field. And um, and once again, just I think it's just a nice little guideline. It's available at we save structures dot dot info. So um, we talk about concrete repair. Um, obviously, if you're on this uh, webinar, you're interested in in the in the subject. And uh, unfortunately, I probably spend too much time driving underneath bridges and looking up at the condition, uh, particularly of, of concrete, my interest. But what is the purpose of the repair? You see a, a visual damage. Um, you see this is a, a, a photograph of netting that's been placed in this arch bridge, uh, basically trying to contain any type of de concrete deterioration or spalling. So um, we want to replace the concrete spall and delaminated concrete and it's going to improve the safety. It's going to improve the appearance of the structures. And if we do, if we follow the right, you know, kind of like uh, proven procedures, the repairs itself will be durable and will provide protection to the reinforcing in the that that is actively corroding in, in the repair area. So when you look at concrete repair, um, you know, I think most people start off by learning about concrete and in, in, in the context of new construction and uh, and I think we need to look at concrete repair a little bit differently where the repair itself is really in a is is a con, is in a confined condition so we're going to do everything we can to have a good quality surface preparation get good bonding so the repair is the material itself is confined so you know, it's we start looking at the re re repair material properties and, you know, th things such as t a 10,000 PSI concrete or concrete mortar may not be the best thing for the structure. You, you may be having high cement contents or whatever, and you could have any type of cracking, you know, plastic shrinkage, dry and shrinkage cracking of the repair material will limit the repairs, you know, durability. So we kind of starting off with uh, re repair material selection can be important because instead of compressive strength, we want materials that are more compatible from a repair standpoint, which may be things such as, you know, the shrinkage of the repair material or modulus or thermal expansion capabilities. So um, just to kind of show that on the different, you know, bond strength is something we normally don't think about in new construction as well. So the re repair material considerations can be different than what you consider for new new construction. So um, once again, this is uh, these are, are images from the ICRI guideline for the surface preparation. So, you know, just following some kind of like good techniques. If you look at the images here on the left, if you did a, a, a sounding or delamination survey, you may end up seeing that your spalled or, or delaminated areas follow the reinforcing steel and may have a pattern. I'm looking at this the second one here, for example, and if you just chipped out the unsound concrete and did the repairs, all of these little reentrant corners or areas where you're going to have cracking. And so any so just from the, the geometry of the repair, in, by making the one re, hand chipping out some sound concrete um, and making your repairs either more square or rectangular as, as, as possible is going to help with the cracking resistance of the repair. The other thing to look at is the um, the, sh the concrete removal and and uh, effectively the reinforcing uh, exposing the exposure the reinforcing. So we want to basically chip around the bars um, and it fully expose any bars in the repair area that are corroded. So and so that you can get the repair material to fully encapsulate the bar. And um, and you also want to make sure you have, you know, there's some materials may claim that they can have a little feather edge. They get kind of thin at the edge, but that's just an area where you can have rapid drying of the repair materials and, and like weak, weak layers. So having saw cut edges uh, around around the, the edge gives you a nice good shoulder for the repair material to, to bond to. And then once again, cleaning, you need to clean the steel very well. You want to get rid of all the corrosion product of, uh, off the reinforcing steel. Make sure you remove any residual cement and chlorides from the steel and pay you know, particular attention to the back to the back of the bars. Uh, make sure that you clean those as well. And here you should see the illustration of a blast cleaning 
where the aggregates or the um, uh, blast media is reflecting off the back of the repair uh, and um, uh, reflecting onto the back of the, of the steel. Bulk concrete removal, um, this, this is when you're going to be chipping out um, basically loose uh, concrete. And also, as I mentioned, you're probably going to be chipping into sound concrete just to make sure that you get the right geometry of your repairs. We want to make sure that we don't do too much damage to the concrete. So the, the weight of the chipping hammer can be important to uh, remove deteriorated concrete without doing too much further damage to the re to the, the base concrete or the substrate. Um, and we want to make sure, as I mentioned before, to have a good surface profile and look at the um, uh, clearance around the reinforcing steel. One good kind of rule of thumb is if you can get your a gloved hand behind the bars, that's probably going to be sufficient uh, distance uh, clearance for the repair material to completely surround. These are just uh, an indication of the concrete surface profile that uh, is a, the document that goes along with the with the um, um, with the, the the chips or the reference um, surface profile, um, and you see the different um, uh, CSPs. And if you start looking into you know concrete repair materials, you're going to be going into CSP five or, or or greater, and this is nice because it'll give you <clears throat> what different types of techniques and tools can be used to achieve the desired service profile. And then you can use the reference chips to, to compare to what you see in the field and see if you're getting the profile that you desire before the concrete repair is completed. Once again, surface preparation, saw cut edges. There's some good, good pictures of that, of that being completed with uh, just a, a hand grinder. grinder. Um, one thing we also want to make sure we're doing is is cleaning the concrete um, uh, and removing any types of fragments uh, or weak pieces in the, in this in the substrate. And this is where you see this image here in the top right, where this is a uh, basically a, a slice into the substrate, which you see different um, micro cracking uh, of, or some people might call this bruising of the concrete. Um, down beneath. So if, if you're going to rely on the, the repair material to bond very well to the substrate, you need to have the sound substrate. So be able to come back with a final abrasive blasting or, or higher pressure water blasting just to remove this these loose pieces and make sure that you have a nice sound concrete surface for the repair material. And then most techniques would require a, a surface saturated a bit dry surface. So basically you want to have a, a, a fairly wet concrete, but not with any puddling on the surface um, to prevent uh, a lot of uh, moisture being pulled out from the repair, repair material into the substrate. So then what you do for the, the reinforcing protection, you know, if you just follow those procedures that we talked about and you're, you're going to have a cl very clean steel, you're going to be coming back with the high quality concrete or mortar it's going to be fully encapsulating the bar in that area. It's going to be uh, a chloride free material, fresh material, highly alkaline. The steel itself is going to be very durable. In fact, it, if I would posit that it would, should be one of the last places that actually deteriorate in the structure is the repair. The re repair should be more, more durable than the surrounding substrate concrete over, over time. But there's times when you may want to look at um, there's different you know, philosophies on, on re reinforcing protection. Um, you, may, you still may want to use a, uh, uh, just provide additional protection to the, the exposed reinforcing in the area. You can use epoxy uh, kind of um, um, coatings, you know, field, field applied just to provide additional protection. You may want to actually even look at that if you have areas of low cover, just to give you some additional protection. Um, we also, and we'll talk a little bit about embedded galvanic anodes. This picture on the bottom right is a um, picture of an embedded galvanic anode that's connected to the uh, the reinforcing steel, which is going to provide protection to that that bar. And then also you can use the embedded galvanic anodes in conjunction with the uh, a, a reinfor reinforcing coating. So um, and that gives you there's some synergy there where you, where um, you really are going to provide protection to the coat to the steel in the repair through the coating. But the anode is providing protection to the surrounding concrete. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Can't forget safety. Uh, we want to make sure that we're following 
uh, all the pro appropriate uh, regulations if you're in the states. We're going to be following OSHA standards uh, and particularly anything that we're doing with concrete, um, concrete repair, there's going to be drilling, chipping, grinding, all these things are producing uh, silica. And so there's a lot of silica reg regulations, um, respirators and other types of silica control. So make sure that um, that you're familiar with those standards and, and are, are providing protection to the workers um, as they're doing the work. Different types of repair materials. We have your trial applied repair. They're really usually, you know, more for vertical repairs that are uh, maybe smaller or, or, or almost you know, somewhat cosmetic in, in nature. You get into like larger, more substantial repairs. You may just go with a quality concrete mix. Uh, foreign poor repairs, shock repairs, et cetera, I would say would be more um, more structural structural in in nature. But whatever you do, these are cement based materials, Portland cement based mostly. And um, and that we can't forget the the importance of curing. Curing is um, for durability. If we want to keep the, the repair material durable, we want we want to keep it crack free. So curing is a to allow the strength development uh, of the of the material is, uh, is is really critical. And then, uh, what do we do if we want to check the repair? This is more along the lines of quality control. You know, you're going to be doing a lot of things that are document documentations. You know, like you know, looking for delaminations, taking photographs. You can do you can do the same thing like concrete mix for new construction. You can do material testing of the of the repair material. Um, but also, um, there are some guidelines you can see listed here from ICRI or, or ASTM for direct uh, bond testing. So you can either test the substrate um, just to see what the direct uh, tensile strength of the concrete substrate is, or probably a little bit more commonly, you would core through a repair into the base substrate and, and glue a disc on and directly pull it off and see where the repair, where it breaks. If it breaks in the repair material, if it breaks at the bond line or, or breaks in the substrate and what's the force is that pulls that off. And so that's a good in situ um, um, quality control method. So like I said before, if you follow the procedures, the repair areas themselves will be very durable and uh, and uh, the, will address the corrosion uh, of the repair. Now, you know, this is where we start thinking about the repairs being uh, just part of the overall structure. Repair is going to be durable, but you see here on the, on the bottom right, that's a photo that I took many years ago uh, in the Northeast, where you see just generations of repair, and you end up ch you're chasing the corrosion issue around the structure, and you see new areas that are marked out, and so for 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 more repair, and eventually that deck's going to need to be replaced at this at this rate. But um, you know, we know that when we're doing the repairs, we are actually creating a risk that there's uh, of what we call halo effect corrosion or new corrosion that occurs in the concrete that is still adjacent to the um, to the, the the repair. So this is uh, just a, a graphic. If you think about the repair here, uh, was originally the area that was corroding. We followed all these great procedures. The steel is going to be very passive in the in that area. Now you still have a high probability you have chloric contaminated concrete surrounding the repair. And now instead of the corrosion being in the repair, it's going to want to shift to the area adjacent to the repair. And that's uh, this halo effect or patch accelerated corrosion. And eventually you'll see new, new, new uh, corrosion cell occur. Just from the difference in the potential between the repair and the, and the surrounding, surrounding concrete. So we start looking at what can we do to provide additional protection. One one method is to look at uh, we call type one anodes. Um, there's uh, um, these are anode galvanic anodes that are tied directly to the steel. There's also type two anodes, which I'll show you some examples of, which can be installed uh, into holes that are drilled in sound concrete. And then there's a, even a third type of anode that's a kind of a newer system that's a co combination of uh, embedded uh, impressed current and galvanic anode, but um, you know, these definitions really come out of the ACI repair application procedure bulletin for embedded embedded anodes. So the idea here is that we we want to 
use an anode in the repair to really effectively keep the new anode or the new area that's corroding from being shifted to the adjacent concrete. So the, 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 these galvanic anodes are they're sacrificial. They're made of zinc with the, uh, an activating mortar to keep it keep it active over time. And the zinc uh, sacrifices itself instead of the steel. And so this is a couple uh, pictures of uh, this type of application. You know, this is uh, showing a, a concrete repair uh, on, on the bottom of the beam um, and the, the subsequent repair. And, you know, I, it's just important to point out that the, the, these discrete embedded anodes are really just designed to make that repair in the surrounding area last longer. If you're going to do the repairs, it's, it's another tool that you can use to make the repair more durable. But they're not really having any substantial impact on other areas of the structure. It's just uh, type one just to make the repairs last longer. There's a large project in the UK uh, as an example where you had a combination of anodes used at these interfaces around joint repairs and throughout some larger, larger uh, concrete repairs um, on the deck. Um, you have other places where you might see uh, re, uh, this interface between new and old concrete where you have a corrosion risk and one area is bridge widening and you see the anodes kind of placed along this along this interface and um, any, any type of structural modification could be an area where you have a new new and old concrete interface so that that's really just the another method to help the, the investment in the repair last longer I just want to take a few minutes here at the end just to say, OK, what about the rest of the structure? What are some of the things that we can do to address the durability of the structure that are beyond the repair? And there's a there's a if you look at the bridge preservation, bridge preservation guide or any of these other industry documents, there's lots of different kind of techniques. And I'm just going to show you a, a few here where this is a, a, a project where uh, you had a a chloride con contaminated <clears throat> substructure and obviously you have um, corrosion that's occurring as causing concrete delamination and spalling and then um, this bridge is over a the rail rail track so um, just with the working with the railroad they want to make sure that they don't have to go back and repair the structure uh, anytime soon so there was an additional investment beyond the repair just to provide some additional um, a corrosion mitigation. So you see in these form and pour repairs, the the type one anodes that are be tied to the, the exposed steel. Then you see a, a series of the type two anodes that are be pla being placed into the sound concrete to pl to provide more holistic protection to the to the columns. And just a little little more pictures here. Here's these type two anodes that have been grouted in. You see the anode grouted into the cord hole. In an interconnecting wire and these are all connected to the reinforcing steel as a galvanic anode system so it's one way you can provide protection beyond 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 the repair this is a project we were involved in you know quite a while ago um, in in the upstate new york where they had the adjacent box beams and really the corrosion problem here was just on one side where you had the drainage uh, from the deck contaminating just this outer face of, of one beam. And eventually this beam was going to be uh, replaced. But to, to kind of hold it they, they in place, they wanted to not only do the repairs, but just use the type two anodes just to provide localized protection just to that just to the area that's actively corroding, just to kind of hold it in place until they could um, replace the, the one beam on the structure. So this is an example of what you might want to call targeted protection. You're just using anodes where you have a known risk of corrosion and targeting them to that fashion. There's the completed repairs. Another thing just to kind of point out um, for durable repairs is, you know, there's, you know, ca uh, carbon fiber or FRP strengthening is, is, is you know, being um, pretty commonly and successfully used for uh, for strengthening of, of structures and you know the ACI committees are basically um, you just want to if you're going to be strengthening a structure the, the the strengthening system is rely upon the the bond of the of the FRP to the to the concrete to, to transfer the load so if you're going to be strengthening structures just there's an encouragement there to look at the if it's actively corroding and if so what, what can you do to address it 
Here's an example of a, a FRP has been applied into a coating structure and you see some failure of the FRP and rust staining. So this is just one uh, one example, one kind of technique where you see the um, some spalling, uh, chloride induced corrosion related spalling, and uh, these uh, needed to be strengthened. So this is one technique where they chipped a pocket vertically on a couple sections of, of a column and connected in uh, distributed galvanic anodes into the slot. Those slots were routed back and then the uh, strengthening was placed on the outside. So you have a strengthened structure with a, with a galvanic protection system underneath of it. Uh, we also talk about uh, when you get in, into maybe more severely deteriorated structures, uh, looking at galvanic encasements, and this will be the topic of a uh, of pretty much a whole uh, series um, in a few months talking about galvanic encasements. But um, effectively, the idea here is you're using galvanic anodes and um, on more severely uh, deteriorated structures, and you're you're in reinforcing it with a new layer of steel, and the galvanic anodes are placed into that overbuilt section connected back into the existing reinforcing steel to provide corrosion protection and then the, you have concrete that's been been placed and this is commonly used for even for abutments um, just uh, an example of this slab bridges we've been involved in a lot of these in ohio some of the original conditions of the slab bridges um, the joint is right over the abutment you know, in, in some of the early days, they were doing some repairs and they started using some galvanic and the small uh, type one anodes. But this is a more of a severely district and widespread corrosion issue. So um, uh, effectively, they looked at using larger distributed anodes in these repairs. And these are uh, 17, uh, this, this project's, um, I think, 18 years now and um, performing very well. So basically, the process here would be to remove the de deteriorated concrete. Um, you place your uh, galvanic anodes into the overbuilt section um, and then here for Ohio DOT they use epoxy coated uh, reinforcing steel just to pr provide some additional reinforcing in the overbuilt section. Uh, form and pour repairs and then uh, these actually use self-compacting concrete and this was one of the first projects that was done in Ohio so you see the monitoring unit that was installed just to monitor the performance of the anodes over time. And if you're interested in that, we have a, a paper that's been published um, with a lot of that data. I can share it with you if you're interested. This is the same structure uh, last year, uh, like I said, I think 17 years on, and you see some efflorescence and in, in leaking, but overall the structure is in excellent uh, kind of structural shape at this point. Um, another, another project that um, just, Kind of more a more recent one just to, we can show as well is the uh, repair and protection of the historic Third Avenue Bridge in, in Minneapolis. This is a major structure over the Mississippi River, historic historic structure, and um, it was uh, if I remember right, hundred year hundred year old bridge, and um, the the scope of work work here uh, was a replacement of the deck. Uh, and, ma and maintaining the existing substructure uh, as well as uh, other things, obviously. But that's the main point we're talking about from a corrosion standpoint. So um, you're um, just to give you an idea of the condition of the of the arches. These are actually Milan uh, steel. So it's effectively uh, the way I look at think of about it. It's a steel it's structural steel frame that creates the the the, the arch itself. And then it has concrete cast around it, so it, does, it doesn't have a conventional uh, rib or, or smooth uh, reinforcing bars. These are structural steel um, members. And over the time, you know, the exposure to the age, the environment, the icing salt, um, you see the corrosion of the structural steel frame in the, in the ribs. And you see even in some intermediate locations where you have some, some corrosion. And so these are uh, more than just a, a patch or just a small repair. These are more substantial uh, repairs and there's a uh, billions of dollars are being invested in the ex extended service life of this structure. So um, a lot of thought was put together for how to uh, extend the life of the structure from a, from a, a corrosion standpoint as well. 
and you see in the areas where you have um, basically concrete damage um, and concrete removal from the corrosion, uh, the the frame here was was coated. So this is the the white here is the existing coating. There was a reinforcing case, encasement around that, and uh, to, pr to protect the underlying uh, steel here, you see the the distributed anodes placed at the along the the structural steel frame at the at the top and the bottom, and then at the at the edges where you have the existing sound concrete uh, that's going to be adjacent to the new concrete. This where we also use some type one anodes. Um, you see them connected to, to a, a drill and tapped self-tapping screw into the structural steel frame, as well as the um, the distributed anodes uh, to the to the same connection. And so that's a very, you know, like I said, a very comprehensive, um, comprehensive mix or of of repair, strengthening of and and uh, and uh, application of 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 corrosion protection to the repair. Now they also looked at what to do for the other areas which were currently sound, but were actively corroding, and and. And how do you do that? You can actually look at, you can actually utilize a technique that's called a corrosion potential survey, where you're effectively measuring um, the risk of corrosion in sound concrete by using a reference cell, generally it's copper copper sulfate reference cell connected to a multimeter, which is connected into the reinforcing steel. So any areas where you, you do a corrosion potential survey and you're seeing that you have a high probability of active corrosion, but you, but you still um, have sound concrete. Um, that's an area where you can look at using other types of protection systems that are, that are more proactive. And in, in this case, uh, they this, this the consultant used a, a custom designed uh, two stage anode. Let me just go back one slide. And the way this works is it has a uh, the it's two stage. So the first stage is a uh, a self powered ICCP system effectively a battery that runs the first phase of, and that could be anywhere from a few months to a couple of years depending on the, the design of the system and during that period of time you have a higher amount of current that's being generated naturally by would have been by a galvanic anode and then the the, the idea is that you would passivate the active corrosion with this higher current in stage one and then when uh when that occurs the the um over time the um it'll automatic automatically switch from the the battery to the galvanic anode and then in that point the galvanic anode is designed just to provide maintenance current to keep the seal from uh, corrosion from reinitiating and these types of systems can be designed for for 30 years of, of protection 20 or 30 years um pretty pretty straightforward and so um, due to the amount of steel that's in the service life that they were requiring for for this uh, these uh, uh, this structure, um, like I said, they used uh, some custom design anodes uh, with uh, extra zinc. And uh, in the areas where you have active corrosion potentials, um, that's, they was, were grouted into place and they have an interconnecting wire that connects them all together, then they're connected into the embedded steel. And once that's all connected, the system operates natural, naturally. They can be monitored um, if you want, or they can just be directly connected and, and operate, um, like, like I said, naturally over time. And there you see um, this the, the installation where you see the, the coring uh, and the grouting, the saw cuts, and finally the, the reinforcing connections that are, are, are connecting it to, this, to the steel. So um, I guess just in in summary, um, you know, uh, we started off. We talked about you know the idea of I would propose over time if we can move from a mentality of of patching, just patching concrete as a uh, and looking at repairs that are that are durable. Then we look at how you make the repairs last longer through you know the different types of industry resources that are already available, kind of proven techniques. And then part of that is also looking at you know corrosion management, even either at a localized level around the repairs or or being identified, being able to identify other areas of the structure 
to, to provide corrosion protection more proactively so that you not only your repairs can last, but you can have a, a longer service life of the, the whole structure. So um, once again, thank you to uh, NCBC for, for hosting this um, and uh, all of their industry um, organizations. And I, I want to thank the, the audience here um, for investing a little time with us today. And uh, hopefully you learned a few things and and um, and the, the information will be available. The slides will be available. So any of those industry guidelines that I mentioned before, which I really encourage you guys to, if you're interested in this, become familiar with um, those will all be documented in the, uh, in the in the slide deck that you'll receive later. But with that, I'll uh, I'll say thank you and I'll turn it back over to to Greg. Well, thanks, Chris, um, and I'm and I will then uh, thank you again for a, for a great presentation and appreciate uh, you leading the group here today. And I know we have a number of questions here uh, that I think Ben and Jackie are going to walk through. Uh, and again, encourage you as attendees to ask questions. There's we we have some time for some Q and A, and um, to me that's the real benefit. You have the opportunity to actually. Uh, Ask, ask an expert life uh, some questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to you all to do uh, to do Q&A. Certainly, thanks, Greg. And thank you, Chris, for this uh, awesome presentation. Uh, we have a load of questions. Uh, we might not get to, or we're definitely not gonna get to all of them uh, <laughs> through this presentation, but um, we will get them to Chris uh, after the show. And so he'll have that whole list and um, as long as you've uh, registered, uh, you'll have, you'll have your, you'll be able to Get your contact information and uh, reach out to you with uh, with some answers. Um, and so, where I'm going to start off with is uh, with Willem. He said uh, most, if uh, not all, uh, state DOTs uh, have comprehensive guides and standards uh, for documents regarding uh, bridge repair. Um, do you know what other uh, organizations are out there trying to help? Um, kind of build uniformity and uh, up-to-date technologies that are uh, I guess just trying to bring yeah. these new uh, technologies to light for for these DOTs yeah yeah I think um, it's a good question um, I I'd, I'd say that the you know we live in this we, we live in a country that you know the states are you know fairly independent with some oversight obviously but I don't think you need to feel like you're alone you know there's there are lots of there's lots of information if you're if you want to start looking at um just your specifications for repairs um there's you, know, you don't have to start from scratch um i think um i think the starting point i would probably look at would be well you have you have some documents that are available you know through federal highway or or, or what have you but I think the International Concrete Repair Institute. If you just start off by looking at the the concrete the 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 guide for surface preparation, um, it just just a, you join the organization. You have access to the access to the documents. Um, there's lots of good you know, and these documents have been around for I don't know, I'm 30, 30, some of 30 years maybe, like. Uh, um, and and um, also in, in ACI, uh, ACI has I think some real good documents. Um, they even have documents that are out there that are available for uh, that can be adopted from ACI 562 the building code. Uh, uh, sorry, the repair code that's being put out there for adoption by building officials. I think there's a lot of good information in there that could be uh, adopted. That's ACI 562 by people in the bridge community as well. And part of that is basically, you know, looking at um, making it more of a process of of making mandatory uh, to do some type of evalu evaluation up front and also to actually specifically identify what service life you want in, in design, because there's some bridges that you're going to need to repair, just like, for example, the the bridge in in New York that I kind of you know showed with the the, the precast box beam, you know, they knew they were going to replace that section in within in ten years. So the the objective there was different than if you're doing the Third Avenue bridge, which is a hundred year project. 
seeking a 50 year solution, you know, so um, the, the, that's really that's really important. So and, and ACI also has concrete repair specifications as well that might be helpful. Excellent. Um, this one was uh, a bit of a theme, so I'll, I'll try to sum up a few of these questions or, or try to add them all into one here. But uh, what is the typical useful lifespan of a uh, like a galvanic system and uh, how can you know that it's still working? OK. So um, obviously. Um, vector corrosion technologies where we've been doing this uh, for a long time and we have a pretty good understanding of how how the anodes work, how they age and um, and how long they'll last and how you design with them. So um, there is a there is uh, on the there is on the uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel that got, has a whole presentation that an hour's worth of of, of that that covers these points. But I think in, in summary, um, if you the galvanic anodes will typically last between I would say ten and thirty years. If you look at if you look at the uh, like for example our standard tables uh, for the spacing of the type one anodes, they're based around having achieving a certain amount of protection at, at twenty years, but the anodes will last will last longer than that. But the the real answer is that's kind of like the standard default. If you want to have a galvanic anode system that lasts for 30 plus years, it, you can you can do that. You just need to d identify that's the objective and have the anode design to the system to, to, to design to last for the desired service life. The other part of the question is, how do you know that the anodes are still working? Um, and all these galvanic just impressed current systems, any kind of systems, um, impressed current systems, I'd say, require monitoring because it's an active system. Galvanic uh, systems generally do not require monitoring, uh, but if you do want to understand if the system is still operating over a period of time, you can um, you can set it up that way initially. And effectively, what you're doing is you would you would take um, a sample, usually like a sample section of the galvanic anodes. I, I just use as a reference the Ohio DOT abutment project where we had 17 years on that on that project. That whole abutment had anodes across it, but one section at the end were all wired to a monitoring box. And that allows us to go in over time and take readings to see to measure the activity of the anodes and also the level of, of performance. So you can definitely do that um, by by setting it up that uh, that way up front. And um, yeah, that's a good. It's a good question. All right. Uh, do you have recommended references for those who are not familiar with the basic concepts of cathodic protection uh, to educate themselves? Uh, yeah, I mean, like you can start off with the uh, go back to like ICRI and ACI. Um, there's an ACI 222 is a, is a corrosion committee. Um, and then you have um, ACI 562 is the repair committee or 546. Um, and they'll actually have some references to cathodic protection in those in those documents. You go to ICRI. The, the ICRI has a very nice overview guide of cath uh, electrochemical treatments, which include cathodic protection as well as chloride extraction and realkalization, these other types of methods. And that's a, that's a really good overview. If you want to take another step up from there, then I would go to AMP, uh, which is the former NACE, uh, and they have a lot of more technical guidelines and uh, specifications for performance of, and of of ICCP and galvanic anodes, their electrochemical color extraction. That would be another another step up. And that's the organization that you can get certification and, and ed educated and, and certified in cathodic protection in the, in the US is through AMP. OK, um, so we got one here. We've been talking about doing repairs, but uh, would you recommend the uh, using some of these techniques uh, in new construction as well? Yeah, you can. Um, I would say uh, historically uh, we see most of the systems going into um, rehabilitation. Um, having said that, 
there's a, a, a quite a few um, volume of, of, of projects that are new construction. I think the 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 situation you have in repairs that you I like, I like to think of it as it's like it's the hand you've been dealt with. You have to kind of have to kind of deal with it at that, at that point. New construction, you have a lot more flexibility in the in the original design on different types of concrete, uh, different um, types of reinforcing steel, um, even even looking at increased cover depths and things like that can and lead you more more to more durability. Um, where where I've seen uh, most commonly reused any type of galvanic anodes in new construction is areas where you as an engineer uh, know over time it's it's a vulnerable place. So are you just say for example on a on a bridge deck, you may not use galvanic anodes in new construction over the entire bridge deck, but you may use them around joints or maybe in some of the areas where you have drainage. Um, maybe you might look at areas around beam ends or things like that where you you know over time you have a high probability you're going to have collection of de-icing salt or or other things and you can use them in, economically in, in a targeted fashion uh, as supplemental protection in that scenario. Sorry, I'm trying to sit through these comments. They're coming in pretty fast. <laughs> so. Um, would you want to elaborate more on the um, of, of the, the effectiveness of attaching uh, anodes or the sorry, using both uh, epoxy coatings and attaching anodes in a repair? OK, that's a really good, uh, good question. So. Um, we believe and we've seen some testing that shows that there's uh, there's synergy there, meaning the galvanic an anode, if you're using a type one galvanic anode, and it's connected to, to this reinforcing steel. In the re exposed steel in the repair. You will see current flow from the anode to the areas outside the repair where you want your protection, but you also will see current flowing to the steel within the repair, which is the area that, that, that's close, close to the anode. Um, by using the combination of, of galvanic anodes and a reinforcing steel coating, you're effectively uh, reducing the uh, reducing the amount of surface area steel that 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 in it's in the repair from receiving current from the anode and that allows the anode to have more capacity to provide protection to the other areas of the structure it's kind of a philosophy that you, you see maybe in underground you know pipe piping systems where you have coated pipe that's protected by a, a cathodic protection system or even it's just a coated sheet pile that's protected with a cathodic protection system. Those are are basically the, the dual action where the the anode is protecting more like holidays in the coating than the, the entire bare surface itself. So uh, there's that's a, that's the fundamental uh, benefit. All right, and I think we are at the end of our uh, our presentation window here. Thanks, Chris, for. Uh, answering all those questions if you have any more questions please feel free to to reach out to him he's uh doesn't sleep at all he just answers and talks about uh corrosion <laughs> questions all day so that's a set uh, he'll be more than happy to answer sad anything sad. that you uh you send his way thank you rust never sleeps and neither does chris ball i guess that's it all right <laughs> that's exactly it but uh with that said thank you thank you very much chris thank you yeah, thank you again, Chris, and thank you, everybody. And uh, um, we look forward to next month's webinar. So hope everybody's already signed up.